Well, I think I'm a little overdue for a podcast. What's going on, everyone? Mike O back with another episode of Hobby Talk. It has been a long time, but I'm thrilled to be back, and I'm also thrilled to be joined by my friend Ed, who's making his return to the podcast. Ed is very active in the YouTube sports card collecting community with the username Wesker Griff. He's also on Instagram, and he's really active in a bunch of Facebook groups as well. So, Ed, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Great to be back. Looking forward to to discuss in various topics in the hobby and in baseball, and it should be a great episode. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. The hobby is very active right now. The hobby is hot. It is uh, something, this hobby has been ascending for years, and it's really reached a pinnacle where it's, it's kind of getting a little out of control when you look at the prices and the amount of attention it's getting uh, in social media and from uh, just a lot of, big voices out there in social media and you're you're seeing a lot of talk about the hobby outside of your normal hobby talk areas so that's something we'll get into of course baseball season is getting close spring training games beginning shortly the season not too much more than a month away so that'll be interesting of course, we had a big, uh, big issues going on in this off season. A lot of controversy going on with the Houston Astros, and of course, that affects the hobby as well. So we have tons and tons to talk about. Yeah, really looking forward to touching on a lot of these topics. But the hobby right now, I know a lot of people have said it in the YouTube community. The hobby right now is extremely strong. Prices are rising across the board for modern and also vintage, and it's just a great time to be a collector. And, I mean, I don't know about you, but is this ridiculous boom in the hobby, is it almost feel like it's too good to be true? Is it, does it have you unsettled at all? Because personally, these last few days, I felt a little unsettled with just how big this boom is and the prices on obviously vintage those prices are going to be there but some of these modern prices are just kind of out of control right now it's it's pretty crazy well from baseball to football to basketball you know even hockey to all the major sports i think you're just seeing a giant influx of a lot of different people coming into the hobby i know with basketball you're seeing the massive overseas push since basketball is becoming more and more of a global sport and the entire Panini prism, you know, boom that's going on. You can't even find the value packs or the blasters anywhere around where I live. And you just got people cleaning out everything when they see it on the shelves Uh, with baseball. You have, you know, the hype with uh, 2020 tops you know, when I went to the card show uh, at Neshamity this past weekend, uh, there was just so much excitement for 2020 tops. Everyone going after Jordan Alvarez and Bo Bichette and every single dealer I talked to, they said 2020 tops was flying like hotcakes. So there was a lot of excitement. Uh, of course, not every, especially for, you know, the modern pro- products more so. Uh, not every one of these guys is going to be a sensation. But it is cool to see all the excitement around the hobby. And uh, myself personally, I'm being a little cautious, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, it's really exciting to see the hobby getting attention and such. And like that's really exciting, obviously. But at the same time, you know, you see these prices rising and certain things start to become unaffordable. And just to touch on basketball real quick, because I think you and I, are both kind of baseball first guys. We dabble in other sports a little bit. I do some football and I know you do a little bit of uh, basketball and hockey as well as football, but uh, basketball is ridiculous. Like, you know, I just see this kind of uh, 
on my peripheral because I don't really pay attention to it super closely, but I know that prism basketball is out of control and optic basketball, which just came out in the last week or two. I think I saw it's like hundreds of dollars, like maybe $400 a box, like for a hobby box, which just sounds completely out of control and just, you know, a gamble that kind of tough to uh, win on. And I know the retail is just vanishing right away and it's like instantly going for double. So basketball is really, I think, the hottest sport in the hobby right now. And you have a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of money coming in from overseas. But also there's just that brand. These certain players have these individual brands. Obviously, basketball league, you have less players and the players are very recognizable. So basketball is just completely crazy. And then, of course, you know, football, hockey are strong as well, but baseball is what we follow. And, you know, the baseball market for rookie cards is it's it's really hot right now. And I guess it'll be interesting to see how long uh, the hobby can sustain that. Obviously, part of the reason is a good economy that allows kind of an extra flow of money. Um, that coupled with the fact that the hobby is growing and a lot of people are finding the hobby again and you have new money coming in. That that explains kind of some of the prices. It's just you have to kind of step back and think, like, how long can this last at this level? Yes, but I do think one of the craziest aspects of the hobby that occurred uh, in this off season, I guess you can say, or uh, the last couple months, easily, in my opinion, is the Kobe Bryant uh, card market because I mean I'm sure everyone listening knows about the tragedy with uh, Kobe's untimely passing and uh, how horrible that was but then you know when that news broke you just see all his cards you know quadruple and if you look at some of the prices on his PSA 10s I mean they're just they're unaffordable for the you know average collector so I mean, to see that explosion, it, it's just it's just kind of jaw dropping. But it also, you know, speaking from my own personal experience, it kind of, you know, I didn't have any Kobe Bryant cards in my collection because when I buy basketball, I mainly focus on the Philadelphia 76ers since I'm a Philadelphia 76ers fan. So after seeing after seeing that, it's just like I had to reevaluate the way I was collecting basketball because, you know, I am a fan of the game. So I want to collect, you know, the star players of the day and to not have a Kobe Bryant card. I mean, that's kind of shameful. So and and now, you know, th those cards will, I think, settle down. I think they will bottom down a little bit, but they're not going to bottom down that much uh, because of how you know, legendary of a player Kobe Bryant was and, you know, everything he accomplished in his life. But, you know, that was probably hobby wise, the craziest uh, story of the last couple months that I seen. Yeah. Those prices just took off when that news broke and, you know, I don't follow that market too well. So I don't know kind of if how much they've come down. I, I suspect they've come down at least a bit from that initial spike, but you know, the interest in that player will always be there and the prices will, you know, probably never drop too much. Of course, he'll be enshrined in the Hall of Fame as well, I'm sure, in the next few months or within this year. I know he's eligible this year. Um, I don't know exactly when uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame has their enshrinement and everything, but, you know, that'll keep interest as well. Not that people didn't know that Kobe Bryant was going to be a Hall of Famer regardless, but you know, the Hall of Fame is something that people in this hobby uh, certainly appreciate, and it gives people a reason to collect. So that that was obviously a, a sad story and kind of one of those things you, you find out about it and you're just thrown off like, wait, what? And, uh, you know, a lot of people like to uh, kind of reminisce and go back and start picking up some cards either that they used to have or adding to the collection. And then, of course, you're going to have people who... Uh, you know, try and pick up stuff just to move, um, to profit off of it. But there was, there was definitely a lot of movement in the hobby on the, in the Kobe Bryant, uh, side of things. We've seen that happen before. I know, you know, recently with Roy holiday, 
you know, I vividly remember, you know, when he had his untimely pass and, and, you know, he kind of almost passed away in similar circumstances in a, an air accident, but you just, saw his prices do the same thing as well. And I think, you know, sometimes we got to recognize some of these amazing players and, uh, and, you know, check out their stuff before, before they leave us. But I mean, we don't realize some of the great talent that is going on right now and some of the legendary players playing. Yeah. I think that's another thing you're getting with the whole uh, card market boom, right? It's a whole bunch of things kind of, coming together at once you have people who are in their 30s 40s kind of refining the hobby um with more expendable income a lot of these people have kids who are now uh, getting somewhat interested in the hobby maybe at a lower level but that's kind of bringing families together to start collecting you have the gambling aspect with all these high value cards out there there's a lot of people um, purchasing cards you know ripping product hoping to hit that $500 $500 card, $1,000 card, maybe that $20,000 super fractor. So the gambling aspect is playing a role for sure. Um, people kind of get into it and get addicted to it. The flipper market, people seeing an opportunity to, uh, you know, make some dollars that's bringing people in. There's, there's so many factors bringing people into this hobby. And I think a big reason is the star power in sports right now. I mean, you look around and we'll talk about baseball specifically, but there's just so much talent. There's so many good players. And at any given time, of course, there's tons and tons of good players. But I mean, right now, some of these guys are just off the charts and some of it might just be human evolution, as funny as it sounds. I mean, look at all these guys with baseball in their blood, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Fernando Tatis Jr., uh, Bo Bichette, Biggio. I mean, you have these guys that just come up with this raw talent, and they're unbelievable. And uh, I think that's a lot of fun. As a baseball fan, it's, it's awesome to follow the sport, and it's awesome to kind of follow that in the hobby at the same time and see these players develop and see their card markets develop. And I think, uh, I think that's another thing kind of driving driving the hobby. Obviously, basketball, you have the brand names. Football, you have some big-time players. And, you know, as we talk about baseball, you just have this incredible talent that is having, uh, having a lot of success on the field at an early age. I definitely agree with that. There's a, You can almost say it's an oversaturation of talent, surplus of talent. I mean – Baseball specifically, you look at every single team and there is at least one player on that team that you could say, we could build around this guy or this guy is a fantastic A-plus player. I mean, every team has somebody like that. I mean, and, and it could be a bad team too. It could be like, you know, the Kansas City Royals. They have Whit Merrifield, hits leader from the last two years. Absolutely stunning player. Awesome. Or you can look at, you know, the Baltimore Orioles who, you know, they are so far into the basement and they were incredibly bad last year, but they still had John Means who pitched fantastic with one of the all time historically worst defenses in baseball still managed to have a 500 record. Or you can look at a guy like Trey Mancini. I mean, so you get my drift though. You can go to any team and still find a perennial super talented player yeah it's a lot of fun and i think if you're enjoying the hobby enjoying the sport enhances your kind of enjoyment of the hobby for most people i'm sure that uh makes sense in some way right and i think the uh the hobby can be an asset to uh enjoying the sport of baseball as well uh they kind of obviously play over each other and I, i always find it bizarre when I hear people who do follow the hobby they're into sports cards but they don't actually watch the games and don't actually follow the current sport I always find that a little bizarre but of course to each their own yeah I always viewed it's the way I have viewed card collecting specifically baseball as you know and I think most people know who are familiar with me baseball is my primary uh, sport that I collect and that's my number one sport, the one I love the most, but I always viewed 
collecting cards as an extension of my baseball fandom. Yeah, it's just it's a I don't know. I, I think it's great. I just think it's year by year to kind of collect different cards from each year. It kind of documents uh, these players, these teams that you follow during any given season. So I think that's a lot of fun. With that being said, you know, we're getting ready for the 2020 Major League Baseball season, which is mind boggling. But uh, it's the reality, right? And 2020 Topps Baseball cards did drop a couple weeks ago. So the start of the 2020 baseball card collecting season is already here as we approach the 2020 baseball regular season. What are your uh, early thoughts on 2020 top series one? Well, it is a very hot product. It is very, very hot, but the hype around it is really cool. I just love seeing the enthusiasm and the passion a lot of people have. Uh, for 2020 tops, I seen that in person, like I mentioned already at the card show that I went to, uh, there was just a lot of people walking around saying, Hey, you have any 2020 tops? Do you have, uh, Bo Bichette rookies? Do you have any Jordan Alvarez? And, uh, do you have any of the rookie cups? So it's, it's just really cool to see. And, you know, we'll have to see how this season plays out, uh, to see how these guys do, but it is a really fun product. And, you know, I like the foils that they've added this year, so uh, it looks really cool. I haven't opened too much 2020 tops yet. I've done a couple blasters, and I've done some uh, value packs, but uh, looking forward to, you know, d- delving more into it. But it's been it's been hard finding it around here. You know, a lot of the targets around here have been pretty uh, bare bones. They've been cleaned out of 2020 tops, so. A lot of collectors in this area, maybe that's why. I know other people have been able to find it, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think as someone who, you know, I enjoy all cards, right? And I enjoy vintage and modern and everything alike. And I love all the uh, diverse products Tops puts out. Obviously, they put out dozens and dozens of products. But something I always look forward to is that flagship top set, right? The same set that goes all the way back to the early 50s. They've been putting it out year after year. You can build team sets. You can build complete sets. You can rip that first pack of the year. It's a lot of fun. And I really have enjoyed uh, the focus back on that flagship product, like the enthusiasm, as you mentioned, the excitement for it. You know, it's a good crop of rookies this year in Series 1. So it's been a lot of fun to to follow people enjoying the product, having fun, chasing the rookies and the parallels. And of course there's all kinds of things to look forward to in the product. And there's going to be a lot of um, other players that come up this year that have rookie cards, but there's something neat about it. Uh, The design, when I first saw it, you know, months ago, I was kind of iffy on at this point, I'm fine with it. I really have no complaints about it. I enjoy the traditional design, so yeah, my preference would be a bordered card and such, but it is what it is. It's year 2020, and I'm I'm cool with design. I'm not saying it's my favorite design, but I've grown very accustomed to it. I like it. I think the rainbow foils look great. I think the gold foils look really cool. Not super into the different color parallels this year. I just don't think they stand out as much as they have over the last several years, but... I think the insert sets have all been really neat, and I I like it. I like some of the retail exclusives, so it, it's really fun to see people having fun in the hobby, breaking it. Yeah, the only thing that I'm not crazy over uh, in regard to 2020 tops is I don't like the fact that the names are sideways, but I can see myself eventually getting over that. I will say it takes a lot for me not to like a design, uh, honestly, the only tops design in recent history that I really, really don't like was the twenty, uh, the two thousand seven design. It's the only version of tops that I just don't like at all. Is that the one? What was Black Borders? Was that oh seven? That was the the two thousand seven. No, oh eight is is the white. Uh, two thousand seven is the black with the facsimile signatures in the center and not only that if i remember right the borders are so big on that card i feel like the photographs are pretty small on that product 
Yes, it's a very strange design, and I, that out of all the designs that Topps has ever done, that is the one that I just I loathe. I I don't like it. Yeah, well, you can't hit it out of the park for seventy years, I guess. But <laughs> overall, yeah. you know, I think they do a good job, and I enjoy it. I do like. Yeah, I agree. I'm not crazy over the uh, the names, the nameplate being sideways like that, but. I've got grown used to it. It doesn't really bother me overall. I think it, you know, I think they did a solid job and you need variety or you can't have the same thing year after year. So it's a lot of fun. And I, I'm, I think the emergence right now in the hobby, right? Everything kind of, there's always different trends. And I feel like the trend right now is geared back towards flagship back towards even in some aspects, paper cards, maybe not Bowman paper, but like the tops paper, because people are realizing they're more condition sensitive than the Chrome. And uh, I think a lot of the focus now is on rookie cards. So that's pretty neat rather than just the hits. I mean, obviously people are buying products and they want the hits, but uh, it seems like even some of the color parallels or photo variations of base rookie cards are a little more in demand than even the autographs, obviously an autograph of a key rookie card is going to hold substantial value, but I do think that's a trend that I like where it's not just all, Oh, I got to hit, get this hit and toss everything else. Yeah, I would say probably, and this has been developing, I would say over the last couple of years, but you're really seeing more of a, I guess back to basics approach for collectors at large where the rookie card has really returned with total authority over, you know, I would say the last 10 to 15 years, uh, it was always about the hit, you know, getting the relic card or getting the auto relic or hitting the autograph. But now it seems to be more along the lines of hitting the rookie card or more specifically hitting uh, a type of parallel of the rookie or maybe a short print or super short print of a rookie card. All right, let's switch gears real quick. Hopefully you don't spend a crazy amount of time on this, but I'm sh- I'm sure we'll spend a few minutes. It's an unfortunate story that's, uh, you know, it's, there's been rumblings about it for a little while, but things really uh, took off this offseason. The Houston Astros, the sign-stealing, cheating allegations, slash, um, obviously, eventually, the report given, proven, punishment handed out. That is uh, something that's kind of rocked baseball this offseason. It, it's something that's, I think, the Houston Astros kind of hoped would be a big, st- well, not that they wanted it to be a big story, but they thought, you know, maybe this would be a big story and then we'll move on and people kind of forget about it. And that has not happened. Uh, it's just getting more and more traction. You have players speaking out on it, fans are upset about it. And, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of effect that has in the hobby. Are people going to continue to uh, collect Houston Astros? Obviously, the Astros have been one of the best teams in baseball over the last three, four years. They're a team that has a lot of players that are hot in this hobby. Alex Bregman, his stuff was insanely hot late last year as he made a push for MVP. Jose Altuve, as he uh, you know, was on his quest for potentially 3,000 hits in a chance to be a future hall of famer and his playoff heroics and then of course they have a number of other stars such as carlos correa and uh, george springer guys who've had a lot of on-field success and uh, at times been darlings in the hobby so i guess uh let's get your thoughts on the houston astros a little bit and you know what kind of role that may or may not end up playing in the hobby Well, I know we have quite a number of Astro fans that are in the community on YouTube. So I don't, I really feel bad for them. Uh, I really feel bad for the Astro fans because you're a fan of a team and your team does something this treacherous. It's, it's, uh, it's gotta really be difficult, but personally, uh, the whole thing is just absolutely horrific uh, the lion that's still going on. I know Carlos Correa did an interview with Ken Rosenthal where he emphatically told Ken Rosenthal that there was 
you know, no sign stealing going on in the postseason. And then you have the following day, Rod Manfrey doing a press conference at the Cactus League saying, no, there was. So it's just the more that these guys are open their mouth, uh, specifically the Astros players, it's just it's just looking worse and worse and worse. It's such a bad look. Uh, what they did, I mean, they cheated. They, th- uh, what they did personally, I think is way worse, way worse than any PEDs or any steroids or anything like that. Uh, because when you're talking about steroids, it's the individual, whereas what they were doing was an organizational thing. It was a whole combined effort. So it's just really, really bad for baseball. I don't like the way that Rob Manfred has handled the whole situation, but as more news is coming out with the players uh, union and the players association, it's shedding a little more light, but it's just really bad. It's a overall terrible situation for baseball. And uh, the fact that these guys, these players aren't being properly punished, uh, I think is a travesty and, more at, when you have players like Mike Trout coming out and voicing their displeasure, who Mike Trout's probably the most, you know, straight shooter, most quietest player. He never, you know, he's very, very quiet. He's, he's never saying anything. When you have him talking about this, you know, it's a big, big deal. Yeah, and it's crazy. Like, in one way, it's given baseball a lot of attention on the national stage, but. I mean, I don't know. I think it is going to raise some interest from the uh, general fan that may not necessarily tune into every game. Like if the Astros have a Sunday night game, I think you might see a little bit of a rating spike. It is going to be fascinating to see how things kind of play out this year. Hey, if the Astros, which I believe they're a very talented team, of course, I don't think they won the World Series and compete it in the postseason only because they were stealing signs. I do think it clearly enhanced their ability to end up winning. Of course, it played a significant role, despite what uh, the owners said and players have said. Uh, but, you know, if they can come out and win the World Series, that'll go a long way to people kind of letting it go a little bit or forgetting about it to a degree. It'll always be a stain. It'll always be a thought. But, I mean, they are facing a ridiculous amount of pressure. I mean, they're going to get booed out of town. Every road game, people are going to be going to the games to boo the heck out of them. I mean, some of the faces of the franchise, the guys that have been involved in these press conferences, and they've all been terrible. The Houston Astros uh, PR team should be fired immediately if they haven't been. I mean, these guys have not been ready for any of these press conferences. They've been absolutely atrocious. I mean, Alex Bregman, Jose Altuve. Like, what happens if one of these guys start the season 1 for 20, 2 for 35? I mean, you could see a real, uh, a real, I think, you know, kind of troublesome stretch trying to get out of that because you are going to be villains on the road and you're going to have that personal pressure on yourself and – a lot of people kind of speaking out against you. So it, it's going to be, it's going to be a fascinating season to uh, follow the Astros. I think you'll definitely see a increased interest in baseball. They'll, they'll definitely receive that because, you know, as far as I go back from watching baseball, we've never had a team that you can synonymously say is the villain. The Astros are so villainous right now. Like pretty much everyone who's not an Astros fan absolutely loathes that team. And, you know, the only other villain that I can think of uh, that that's been in baseball is, you know, Barry Bonds was a little villainous. There was a lot of people who were against him. Uh, You can maybe say A-Rod too. There was a lot of people against him, but I've never seen a fandom, uh, the baseball fandom so united against a particular team. And when you go on social media or you go on Twitter and you see what regular fans are saying, you know, people want to tune in because they, they want to see these guys, you know, get some road justice, I guess, or, you know, like Nick Marquez said, he, all these guys deserve a beat. And so you're going to have fans tuning in to see what other players 
how they're going to handle them not getting suspended, how what they're going to do about it. And, you know, you mentioned it, Mike, the Astros, they are an insanely talented team. They have so many great players on their team. And I think that's why this whole entire ordeal is so disappointing because they didn't need to do that. I mean, they already had the talent, Altuve, Bregman, Carlos Correa, Springer. They were loaded with such great talent. They had Verlander, Garrett Cole. So they had so many fantastic players. So that's why I think that's why it stings a lot more for your average baseball fan, because they're like, this team was really, really good. And they were doing that. So I think that's why a lot of people see it as unforgivable. Yeah, and I think baseball has become a very localized sport, right? So we're Phillies fans, the two of us. So the Mets are a villain to us, maybe to a degree, the Braves, Nationals. Sometimes it can change depending on the ability of the teams in your division. Uh, I think certainly the Yankees are always deemed as a villain in the sport just because of their history of success. But generally speaking, unless you're – a member of the AL East, you're kind of like, hey, I'll root for the other team because the Yankees have won so much. They're not quite as bad. The the Astros, really though, they they are the villain of the story at this point. So, I actually am kind of getting even more and more excited as we talk for 2020 baseball. Should be a lot of fun. But kind of jumping back to the hobby aspect, I mean, do you see this playing a role or a continued role? I mean, if you Browse eBay. I mean, people are still buying Altuve rookies. The price is certainly down from the uh, the point they were at in the postseason. Uh, Alex Bregman, I haven't really kept up with his market a lot lately, but I think last time I did see, they certainly still had strong value. They haven't, you know, the bottom hasn't dropped out, but I guess what will be interesting is, Will it drop out? Are there going to be people collecting? I mean, certainly Astros fans are still going to collect. But are other people just going to go, I want nothing to do with the Astros cards. I'm not collecting them because I feel like that's something that might be a mindset of yours. Or are people going to be interested so they will follow and maybe even make some purchases for these Astros guys? Because it's certainly given them a lot of press. Well, I think the only precedent that we have uh, hobby-wise for something like this are the PED guys. And as you know, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, you look at the prices, uh, Mark McGuire, you look at the prices of their, their cards. And for their accomplishments, what they accomplish in the game does not reflect uh, their hobby value. So I think with the Astros you'll see a drop off, but I think most people are in a wait and see approach, uh, specifically to certain players on the Astros. I feel like a lot of people are in a wait and see approach with Altuve, I think with Bregman uh, and all those guys, but speaking for myself personally, you know, I don't have that many Astros cards. I do have several Altuve's uh, rookies and, autographs same with Bregman and same with Carlos Correa you know I'll hold on maybe to one or two of my Altuve's but uh, I'll probably be dumping uh, the rest of those guys or who knows maybe they'll have a great season this year and they'll silent they'll silence people but I'm telling you this right now if they go out there this year for 2020 and a lot of those guys struggle like you you mentioned like they start off over 20 or over 30 or they're only hitting 200 in April, you're going to see people dumping those cards at an alarming rate. That's definitely a possibility. Um, and I agree. There's a lot of people who have invested a lot of money in some of these players and they're going to be hesitant to um, sell too low or sell too quick. Cause certainly these guys um, still have a lot of upside. I mean, Alex Bregman's still a very young player. Altuve is still in his prime. Uh, so personally, I I had accumulated like seven or eight Altuve rookies in Gem Tens from the uh, Tops Update card. And when this story was kind of breaking and developing, I took two of them and I just wanted to sell a few of them off. And I put them up 
at a reasonable price, I thought, and I got so many offers from people just kind of consistently offering me like forty dollars, just trying to, I guess, grab them and be able to flip them. You know, it was obviously people who were investing in it that were, uh, you know, I don't think they were planning on holding them long term or were even collectors. I did end up settling and selling a couple of them off, and pretty much got my money back. Just wanted to get out from under a few of them, but it's uh. I don't know. I, I think it's one of the storylines, not only in baseball, but in our hobby this year is what happens with the Astros. How do they perform? And uh, whether they perform good or bad, does that, um, you know, how does that play in this hobby? Because, I mean, you saw, I don't know, well, I don't know if you saw Ed uh, on social media. I think I saw it on either Instagram or Twitter. You know, Tops is down in spring training, and they do promotional stuff. And they had Houston Astros players opening the cards, uh, opening twenty twenty Tops. And I did see a lot of people responding to some of those comments, which I'm sure Astros and Tops probably didn't appreciate. I saw uh, one of the uh, responses was, "I'm sure the Astros weighed all the packs so they get the open the packs with hits and all kinds of stuff." So that's something that is gonna, not going to leave the Astros side uh, anytime soon. No, those guys are – it's going to be a scorched earth policy on the road with them everywhere they go, and it doesn't matter. They could be going to you know, New York. They could be going to play the Yankees, or they can be going down to the Trop in Tampa Bay. No matter where they go, they are going to hear it full tilt from any fan within ear distance of them. And I can't wait to see what happens when they go to New York. I think that's just going to be when they play the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. I think you're going to see you're going to see stuff that we've never seen before, or stuff we haven't seen in a long time from a fan perspective. Those fans are going to really, really let them have it, and you know that's kind of entertaining because I kind of want to see how these players respond. I want to see how Jose Altuve responds. I want to see how. You know, a young player like Jordan Alvarez, who really doesn't have anything to do with uh, that whole cheating scandal, how he's going to, you know, be able to do this. So those guys are going to have to be extremely mentally tough. And, you know, uh, yeah, if it's a close game, I mean, you're going to have chanting for nine innings every time these guys come in the batter's box when they're in the field. I mean, you're going to have the fans chanting and booing. Uh, I think maybe we should take a road trip to an Astros Yankees game. The ticket probably be unaffordable, especially for the first game, but that would be a lot of fun. It's it's kind of unfortunate, not that the Phillies have really been directly affected by this, uh, but it would be interesting if they came to Philadelphia this year because obviously the fan base here uh, loves to look for any reason to kind of boo. So that would have been a would have been a fun game to attend. There was nothing more disappointing than going through the Philly schedule and seeing that they play all the teams from the AL, uh, from the AL West, and then seeing the one AL West team that we don't play at home is the Astros. I wanted to go to that game so bad, but they played Houston at at Houston this year. So, hey, at least we get the Rangers. There you go, the Texas Rangers. Should be fun stuff, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's a big story in the hobby and in baseball, and like I've said, it's going to be interesting to see how things play out. Uh, back to just kind of talking about the hobby in general, as we've talked, the hobby the hobby's hot, right? The hobby has been growing for a number of years. It's been gaining more and more attention, and I think something like social media helps spread the word, because not only are fans and collectors finding each other and having someone to share the hobby with, but people are able to promote it. And you have some big names out there. You have a guy like Gary V, uh, well-known, uh, a well-known social media guy, right. Who has millions of followers. And he used to be involved in sports cards back in the day. And he kind of refound the hobby and saw how much potential. And he, he's someone, he's a business guy. So he, I think he has a love for cards and has a history with cards, but I think he also sees the potential to make a quick buck or two. But he's been talking about sports cards, right? So that naturally will bring a lot of people in. It will give people attention. Now you have a guy like Phil Hughes who 
started his own YouTube channel and he's on Twitter and stuff like that. He's got the YouTube channel Phil's Pools. And just being a big name, he's naturally going to gain uh, subscribers and followers and bring people in who, you know, are they know who Phil Hughes is, right? So that's why they're checking it out and then they're kind of coming into the hobby. So when you see these big names promoting the hobby, that's going to attract more and more people and then those people are going to talk to friends of theirs and bring more and more people in. So the hobby's growing. It's getting a lot of attention on social media. It gets attention on stuff. You you see it on MLB Network too when Tops comes out, they'll open and promote Tops a little bit. But the one thing we haven't seen a crazy amount yet because it's there's so much online, there's online stores popping up all the time. Uh, there's eBay, all that stuff. It's kind of an individual marketplace. You don't really see the card shops popping up much, right? There's still some few and far between. I'm sure there's some new ones here and there. Uh, and card shows. Card shows are a ton of fun. We're not seeing that many new shows, at least locally for us. But the shows we have, the Philly show, which is a regional show that takes place three times a year, and some of the local mall shows that have been running for years, uh, they feel different. Are you uh, are you with me on that? Like they feel like a renewed energy, more energy, more people, better attendance, um, kind of more dealers coming through, fresher products, and a lot of excitement. There's definitely, for card shows in particular, they are definitely on the up and up. I mean, the attendance, especially at the Philly show, I mean, when we went to the Philly show, it was wall-to-wall people. We were packed in like sardines, couldn't even get down the aisle. So the dealers at these shows, they're doing pretty well. And it's cool to see that card shows are really booming. You did mention that there's really not a lot of new shows, but the shows that are going on, you know, like the Philly show, like the local mall shows, and then the summer shows in in New Jersey – They're doing incredibly well. And I think a big reason that card shows in particular are doing well is because with, you know, what the majority of us buy our cards online via eBay, but now with the sales tax, you know, if you're going to buy a hundred dollar card, do you really want to pay $10 in sales tax? Whereas you can go in person, you can hold the card, you can look at it, you could talk to the dealer and you can negotiate a price and it's so much easier. So I think that's that's part of the equation of why card shows are up. Yes, there's a renewed passion and a renewed energy for the hobby. But I think also why you're seeing such an increase is also because it gives you a reason now to save money when you're buying it in person. Yeah, I think definitely the, uh, the online taxes, right, that has made things like the card shows a little more competitive. Um I also wonder if part of it is the amount of attention the hobby's getting, you know, kind of in pop culture a little bit. Not not that it's even close to what it was really in the 80s or 90s among the general audience, but you have more and more people kind of accepting and understanding the hobbies around and people talking about it. So I think that maybe, you know, for years, some people would just kind of collect, they wouldn't. They'd be into cards, of course, and they would collect, but they wouldn't have anyone to really share it with. And now there's such a renewed interest in the hobby. I think it almost gives some people a reason to kind of get out and go physically go to a show and be able to look at the cards and converse with dealers and fellow collectors. And, you know, some people get to know each other through social media, whether it be in Facebook groups, localized um, Twitter, I mean, huge card following on Twitter, people messaging people back and forth all day, every day. Instagram is huge. It's probably the biggest of all the uh, social media aspects. YouTube to some degree as well. Of course, we're involved in that. We're meeting people at shows all the time that we've gotten to know through that. But I, I do think that the acceptance of the hobby has kind of almost given people a... Uh, kind of a confidence and uh and a desire to actually get out and go physically uh make their presence at these shows i mean of course it's with new people involved as well but obviously we know we can buy virtually any card we want at any time uh through stuff either websites or ebay so 
I do, uh, I don't know. I think it's a lot of fun and it's going to be kind of interesting to see how much these shows continue to grow, uh, going forward. And if new shows pop up, I would like to see new shows pop up and have a few more options, but you know, the national sports collectors convention has been growing every year for the last several years. Uh, this year it's not in the most popular of destinations. It's awesome for us, for us guys here on the East coast. It's great. It's in Atlantic city, New Jersey, fairly quick ride, uh, but for the general audience, from people across the country, they have to fly into Philadelphia or New York, uh, generally speaking, and then have a little bit of a hike to get to AC, but people will still come. People will enjoy it. And I think uh, it's going to be f- really interesting to see how big that is this year because I'm sure it will probably be a record-breaking uh, attendance again, specifically for the Atlantic City show. So it's something to... Uh, I-, I know I'm pumped up and always excited for it, but... I think there's just even something more special this year with how much the hobby has grown and is booming and brings excitement. Yes. And I'm really curious to see, you know, how busy Atlantic city will be because I remember when the show was last air in 2016 and I went to the national in 2016, then I went in 2018 and 2019. So I've been to Atlantic city, Cleveland and Chicago And when I went to Atlantic City, it felt like night and day compared to Cleveland and Chicago. But with Atlantic City, it felt like more intimate. Uh, It was a little it felt a little smaller uh, convention center wise. But I'm really but the I remember after that Atlantic City show in 2016, I remember the people who run the national, you know, were very appreciative of the city and we're very happy over the turnout and they were happy of all the dealers had rave reviews and everything. So if you're listening to this and you're on the fence about coming, I highly, highly recommend, you know, coming to the national in Atlantic city, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and you'll be, I mean, it's the national, it's the Mecca for sports card shows. So make it happen. If you're on the fence, I'm telling you, it's worth it. Make it happen. Yeah, it's an unbelievable experience on so many levels. Uh, Just for the cards, just to walk around and gaze at the cards. I mean, you're going to see anything and everything. There'll be plenty of stuff that most of us can't even dream of purchasing. But just to see it, it's pretty special. It's pretty unbelievable. And... You know, you can shop and find awesome stuff. You can find some oddball stuff that you don't see every day. And you can get some great deals. You can get the hottest and newest stuff. You can participate in wax. There's actually a lot of great deals on stuff like wax. It's a great time, you know, especially if you're within driving distance and you don't have to worry about either shipping product or overstuffing your bags as you try and fly out. I mean, some of those promotions to get those... uh the silver packs or the, uh, you know, whatever the exclusive packs that tops has this good value in there. So it's like, maybe I should make this purchase, uh, at the national so I can get these packs. Uh, there's, there's a lot to see. There's a lot of panels, all the big dealers are there. All the big promoters are there. The auction houses, the companies tops panini. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, then when you get into autographs and all the uh, all the guests who arrive, there's a lot of options, and that doesn't even you know kind of include uh, hanging out with fellow collectors and getting involved like that. I mean, there's so many groups of people from throughout social media that get together and have a great time. It's it's definitely a trip worth making, and you don't have to come with a ton of money in your pocket. Obviously, yeah, you want to be able to pick up a few cards and remember, hey, I picked this up at the National, but it's just an experience to go and kind of walk around and take it all in. It's it's awesome. It is, uh, it's about the best uh, card show experience you can have. And I th- there's two things that, uh, that I actually remember very vividly from 2016 uh, from the National. One is that compared to Cleveland and Chicago, there was way more vintage at the Atlantic City National than the other two in Cleveland and Chicago. 
And I, I kind of speculated why, why that is, wondering why there's so much vintage at the Atlantic City National. And that's because uh, there's a lot of vintage on the East Coast. Uh, it's primarily on a lot of the vintage, a lot of these vintage dealers are on the East Coast. But the other thing that I vividly remember from the 2016 National is just mountains and mountains and mountains of uh, value boxes, 25 cent boxes, 10 cent boxes, dollar boxes. Not to say that, of course, they had mountains of boxes there too, but I just remember just rows and rows and rows as far as the eye could see at the Atlantic City National value boxes. So I'm really hoping that those dealers will return for 20 from, from 2016 and be there in 2020. Yeah, I'm sure they will. It'll be a lot of fun. I'm excited for it. Heck, I'm excited for the Philly show coming up in the next two weeks, really a week and a half or so from this recording day. It's going to be fun. I'm sure we'll be hanging out, hopefully maybe even making a video, something uh, we haven't done recently at the, uh, at the Philly show, but I know uh, a few of our friends are planning on heading there and, it's just, it's a lot of fun. That's what the hobby's all about, right? We all take it seriously at times, and we should. You put a lot of money into it. Whether you're breaking product, I mean, these products are not cheap. If you're purchasing cards, I mean, even if you're buying 5 and $10 cards, enough 5 and $10 cards add up. Becomes 100 becomes 200 becomes 500 really quickly. If you're collecting rookies, if you're involved in grading, the process of getting cards graded, the expense... And then if you're purchasing graded cards, this stuff, this costs a lot of money. And uh, it's a hobby, but it's something you have to take seriously because of the expense. And um, But ultimately, you know, it's about fun. It's about having fun, enjoying the hobby, loving the cards, uh, having a reason to uh, purchase the cards. And everyone has different reasons. Some people are buying, purchasing cards and collecting cards for nostalgic purposes. Some people... It's because they're enjoying following these players and they like to speculate kind of just for fun. Some people are making a living or a side hustle out of it. But uh, I do think it's important to, to kind of take a step back and kind of think about why you're involved and make sure you're responsible with it too. I, I mean, I think that's a little PSA there. Uh, from time to time, we have to reel ourselves in. But the hobby's fun and it's it's definitely in a really good state right now. I hope it can sustain itself. I mean, we'll see, of course. That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother episode. But just love the hobby, right, Ed? Definitely. And collect with your head, not over it. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely a good thing. And collect from the heart. Use your heart to help others. Yeah, we can go on for hours about, you know, how to be a great collector and a great asset to other collectors. Yeah, there's just it's just a really great time to be collecting. There's tons of enthusiasm, you know, tons of excitement, and you know, things are on the up and up. Uh, of course, you got people out there who are a little skeptical. Maybe the, they think maybe there's a bubble, but you never know. Just have fun with it. As long as you're having fun with it, you won't be disappointed. Before we wrap things up. Uh, just kind of want to get your thoughts. Is there anything, you know, with some of these shows coming up, of course, the availability or the ability, I should say, to purchase cards uh, around the clock, uh, anything that you're currently looking for or anything that you're excited um, for in the next couple months that you're hoping to pick up? Well, I think at the uh, one of my goals for the national this year in Atlantic City is to pick up an update trout rookie. And I was leaning towards the PSA 10 because it's just more convenient for me with the national and Atlantic city. since that's going to be a high dollar purchase, but now I'm leaning more towards maybe the PSA nine because I knew the, I know the trout PSA 10 was a thousand dollars in Chicago, but I think it's gone even more up. But uh, if I'm going to make a big purchase like that, uh, that would be the best opportunity since I don't have to fly, I don't have to carry money on me. I can just, you know, bring it from where I live. And also, if I'm going to make a high dollar purchase, uh, you want to do it in person now with the sales tax because there's no way I'm paying over $100 on sales tax on a 
big purchase like that. I'd rather just do it in person. So you're looking at the fine nine, Mike Trout rookie. Yes, as a wise man once said, buy the card, not the grade. But that is, you know, we can laugh <laughs> about that, but it's definitely great advice. I, I think there are a lot of people who get wrapped up in that assigned grade. And, you know, I think we all would like to have the highest grade we can afford, right? That's just kind of natural instinct, but you want to make sure you enjoy the card. There have been times where I've picked up a PSA 10 card, and I'm like, ah, there's something about the centering I don't love. Like, it's good enough to fit in that PSA 10, but centering bugs me. But so definitely want to enjoy the grade. I'm definitely looking forward to the National just to see kind of what kind of oddball stuff, what kind of pre-war things I could add to the Phillies collection, hopefully at a reasonable price. Um, even though it's somewhat local to Philadelphia, it's not going to have, I don't think, any kind of negative effect price-wise because there's just so many dealers that will be in town from Virginia, Baltimore, Boston, New York, all these areas. So th- that's the types of things I like to look for at the National Philly show. I don't even have anything in mind. I just want to go hang out, look around, hit up the value boxes, and I'm always browsing on eBay looking for stuff adding Ginter autographs to my collection, checking out eBay, just trying to follow things. So it's a lot of fun. There's always things to pick up, which is something that uh, that also fuels our love of the hobby because there's always new products coming out, new cards being created, but there's so much stuff that's been uh, produced in the past that you're always discovering new things or you're always getting ideas from fellow collectors and that's sparking your interest. I'm like, oh, Maybe let me check that out. What have they made of that particular type of card in a player or team I collect? So that's uh, one of the reasons you kind of that I give for people to make sure they're checking out uh, other collectors' collections because you can definitely find a ton of great inspiration. Definitely agree with that, Mike. All right, Ed, I appreciate you joining me on an episode of Hobby Talk. It's felt really great to finally get back and uh, produce another episode. I certainly expect to do more of these. We'll shoot for a minimum one a month, ideally. Love to get out a couple a month, but we'll see. You know, life gets hectic, life gets busy. Can't make them all the time, but I'm thrilled to uh, get one out. Look forward to other guests. Appreciate everyone watching as always, listening, whatever you're doing, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's over on SoundCloud, if you're downloading this on the iTunes store, leave comments, like, share it if you enjoyed it, uh, and let me know what you thought and if there's different guests or different topics you'd like to see uh, discussed or different people. If you want Ed back. Let me know. Maybe we'll bring Ed back on the show again. I'm sure we will. Right, Ed? You'd you'd be all right coming back? Yeah, I'll make a return. Why not? Yeah, why not? All right, Ed. (laughs) Once again, I appreciate it. Thank everyone for listening. Have yourselves a great one.